Well, good evening, church family. I hope that today finds you well and that God has blessed you richly up until this point this evening. Tonight we're going to be engaging in some time of prayer and scripture study together as a church family. And so we want to just transition to that time now uh, and, and engage our hearts and make our minds ready. So let's enter into a time of prayer. Father, we stop and steady ourselves and take a moment to come to you and to ask you, Father, to remove any Im impediments in our minds and our hearts, any sin that we come into this time with, and that you give us grace and love to pray for those who are in need and a mind to engage in that and remember that. Father, I pray for just an understanding of an encouragement this week in your word through the story of your people and that in that in that word and that encouragement and that story that we find life change and the power and the ability and the encouragement to move on and move forward. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Well, we've got a few things tonight that we're going to be praying about that I want to uh, make sure I get to you here at the beginning, and then uh, we'll pray for those, and then we'll enter into some time in studying Scripture. We want to continue to remember and pray for all of our police officers and for our first responders and those who are uh, dealing with so much right now in terms of how to handle the social landscape of things that are going on and how to love well and also correct and try to be the best representatives they can be for the tough job that they're called to do. We want to ask for special prayer for those first responders and those doctors and nurses who are still addressing the COVID crisis. Um, Alabama has not slowed down. We're getting as many new cases just about every day as we've had at any point in time during this crisis. Cities like Montgomery, Birmingham, Mobile, all really struggling heavily with the effects of this disease. So we want to be praying for those people involved in that process. We also want to be just praying for our, our communities. Um, our communities are hurting right now. Our brothers and sisters in Christ are hurting right now. And there's a lot of turmoil and a lot of turnover. And um, I posted a, a video today and a couple other things to hopefully help us navigate some of that. But y'all, this is going to be hard and it's not getting any easier anytime soon. And so um, I thought tonight would be an appropriate time to talk about a topic and a subject in just a few minutes that will hopefully help us to push through some of that. I talked about weariness last week, and this week we're going to look at God's Word in, in First Kings and see something about what Elijah had to deal with and how that might be a word of encouragement to us. So we want to be praying for that. We also want to be praying for um, the family of a uh, couple that have passed, for Steve Smith's family, Ms. Paulette, and for the Thompson family, so that'd be you know, Ms. Verlin and, and her sisters and um, for the kids and for all those that are struggling right now with the loss of Mr. Cecil. I want to remember um, Carrie Hatcher's mom and Stacy's mom as they both are recovering from some injuries and for uh, Betty McGill that she would get to come home to the retirement village soon as she's struggling to uh, just to, to recover and get back to normal. Obviously, I want to continue to Mr. Walt and... Um, Miss Joanne and several of those who are, are trying to fight off and mend back some things that are broken. We want to remember the Bedsole family. Uh, they are dealing with a myriad of health issues. Uh, they're going to have a couple of surgeries coming up, one for Dale, one for um, Jacob with his foot, some things going on, and then Stephanie still has to get her, her foot fixed as well. So a lot of prayer for, for the Bedsoles. Just bathe that whole family in prayer as they deal with cancer and injuries and recoveries and all as well. Um, there's a lot more prayer requests that I could mention, and you all know those, I'm sure, better than I do, but we want to spend some time in prayer for just all those things that we've mentioned so far and, uh, and keying in on the world that we live in right now and praying for those that are hurting. So let's take some time and pray, and then we'll get into studying God's Word together. Father, we want to ask you to provide right now, God, to provide a way, to provide for those who are hurting, uh, God, both physically and socially, and what I mean by socially, Father, is just in the, the construct that we have as a culture, one that has struggled to deal with race relations and relationships to the law and to those in charge for as long as our country has been um, been a thing, and Father, to be, to be established. 
I pray for those churches that are in the hot zones of these, that are trying to love people through it, these issues, and trying to serve them as best they can. I pray you would give these pastors and these leaders and these lay leaders and these church members wisdom to reach out and love people with as much as they possibly can unconditionally so that people on all sides of this would reconcile together and that we would help to speak a true voice into what it means to treat one another um, equally with as much love as we would love ourselves, as your word calls us to do. God, your word is so faithful, and we we go back to that. We go back to say that, yes, God, we are supposed to first and foremost love you completely, heart, soul, mind, and strength, and body, and all understanding. But God, the second commandment is one that's like it, to love each other as we love ourselves. And Father, I, I fall short of that standard. I admit that I fall short of that standard, and that I don't go and reach and love nearly as much as I should, but, or even that I can, Father. And just transparently, God, I ask that you would break me and, and bend me and mold me and make me into your will and your image, that you would do the same with all of us that are here, that are struggling and, and wrestling with what it means to be a Christ follower in a broken culture. Father, let us be a light in the darkness. Let us go to those who are hurting and sick and when we say father that we will pray for them that we earnestly mean those words that we would not make ourselves out to be liars or to be thieves or to be covetous but father we would be what we proclaim to be the children of yours so lord i just ask for this time now that we have to pray for those who are hurting God, those prayer requests that i've mentioned already for those who need a special touch from you right now that you um, men broken bones and cancer ridden bodies and um, bruises and bumps and those that are just struggling at this point in time and that you give us the capacity in this very difficult time that we're in health wise to serve them and love them as best we can may we be encouragements to one another and that we love one another well it's in your name we pray amen all right so i want to talk to you guys tonight about um just this topic of connecting the sinews of Scripture, especially when it comes to the issues of ups and downs in spiritual life. Um, First Kings is a story of the, the kings and a lot of the prophets of Israel and of Judah and those who struggled and those who tried their best to do what God was calling them to do to lead well, but just realized that there were shortcomings and, and they fell short of the standard that God had set them uh, untoward. And so you get characters like David, who is a man after God's own heart, and he's he's fantastic and he's a good leader and he loves people. And then you get someone like Solomon, who um, starts out well and, and has great wisdom, but wants to please people too much and ends up just screwing the whole thing up in a lot of other ways. And then you get Jer Jeroboam and Rehoboam who follow them up. And you get Asa who does a great job, not unlike Jeroboam and Rehoboam, but then several kings after Asa just fall apart again. So much so that all of the godly prophets in Israel are all murdered by Ahab and Jezebel. And you're probably familiar with the name Jezebel. That's one that we kind of associate in our Southern culture. It's a colloquialism. Uh, but she was a wicked queen. And an awful woman, and Ahab uh, was awful in his own right, and they killed all of God's righteous um, prophets except for Elijah, and it's because they couldn't catch him because Elijah delivered the word of the Lord and then ran, took off. He was hiding in caves, mountains, uh, villages, and being protected and being uh, comforted. He was fed by, that's where you get like the story of uh, the widow and the, her son who had just a little bit of um, wheat and oil left and uh, Elijah asks him for food, and, and God provides, and he keeps filling up that jar over and over and over so that every day she goes to make bread. If she makes it for the prophet, then she's got some until the famine's over. So um, what I thought would be maybe we could take some of these sinews and, and connect them together to form a body and a life, especially the life of Elijah, because Elijah is speaking a message that is unpopular uh, in a time of success we'll say culturally uh, they're the people of Egypt uh, the people of Israel are and Judah are prospering they've got food they've got land and Elijah's just trying to speak truth and then a famine comes God gives Elijah a word to declare to King Ahab that because of the wickedness of Israel and Judah there's going to be a famine and not like a little famine like a big famine for a long time and all the food's going to run out and Elijah says, until 
I come back and declare to you otherwise. So, uh, you know, the king kind of wants to find Ahab, Ahab kind of wants to find Elijah. He sends out people to look for him and find him, and, and he wants to bring him back and force Elijah to make it rain again. Sounds like a good idea if you're a ruler to me to come back and find the guy that broke the system and make him fix it to begin with. But the reason the system's broken is not because Elijah just declared it to be so. Elijah is declaring the word of God. Elijah has a big win. And his big win is God uses him to speak. Then he gets scared and he runs and he flees and he hides. And he has a downturn. But then eventually he has another upturn. And this upturn is one of the more familiar stories that we have in all of Scripture, probably, it's that story of Mount Carmel where Elijah is against the 450 prophets of Baal, Asherah. This is the false gods. These are the, the ones that they built the high places to, if you've kind of been tracking with maybe what I've been talking about in my morning and evening discussions. And so these would be popular opinions to say that there are multiple gods and everybody's right, and so they all worship this polytheistic, which means there's many gods system, where the Asherah pole or the, the Baal figure, however you want to phrase that, is the person who's the ultimate goal. So they're celebrating the culture, so to speak. They're celebrating everybody be able to worship whatever they want to. And I'm not big on making one-to-one -one connections between our culture and another culture because I don't think that's necessarily helpful. But can say that some of the characteristics of human nature are similar. People will always want to be as inclusive as they possibly can by allowing in whatever behavior they want. Israel at its wickedest point is when everyone does what's right in their own eyes, to quote the scripture. So what Elijah is doing is he's saying you can't live that way. It's not God honoring to live that way. And he goes and he has maybe one of the great spiritual victory moments in all of the Old Testament as he stands on Mount Carmel. And when he stands on Mount Carmel, he says, go tell Ahab, I'm here. Go tell him. Go tell him I'm here and I'm waiting to deal with him. So that's what happens. The servants go and they tell Ahab that Elijah's there and they show up with 400, 450 prophets of Baal and then Elijah's standing there and Elijah says, you know what? You guys go ahead. You go first. Get Set up your altar. Call down your gods to, to smoke up your sacrifice and, and I'll be glad to just back away and leave and I'm sure it'll rain again. So they go and they dance and they sing and they utter mutterances. They do all the things that they would do to conjure up an appearance of their God, and nothing happens. So Elijah, uh, being the good sarcastic guy that he is, says, you know, maybe you're not loud enough. Maybe you need to turn it up a little bit. So they do. They cut themselves, and they bleed themselves, and they go until they're a horse, and nothing happens. So Elijah says, okay, my turn. He says, I'll tell you what, uh, why don't you go ahead and grab some water and fill all those jugs up and, and dump it on my altar. So they dump all these jugs of water in the altar. And then he says, uh, you know what, why don't you uh, do it again? So they fill it up again. He says, uh, why don't you go ahead and do that a third time? So the third time he dunks all the water on the altar. And he says, the, the Bible says that it was enough to that filled the moat around, the, the, the trough around the altar with water. It was just it was completely and utterly overly drenched and soaked. Now, mind you, this is water when water is hard to come by. But he tells them to dump it, and so they dump it. Then Elijah, standing there, calls on God and God sends down a pillar of fire that consumes the sacrifice and the burnt offering and many of the prophets. Now, I want to go back right before this happens. Elijah is talking to the people of God, God's people who have rejected the Lord. And he's talking to them and he wants to know who's with God. Before anything happens, he wants to know who's with God. I'm going to pick up in, a lot, in 1 Kings 18, 20. So Ahab summoned all the Israelites and gathered the prophets of Mount Carmel. Then Elijah approached all the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? Talking about serving God or serving Baal, which they have been doing since Solomon. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people didn't answer him a word. I want to stop right there for a second because to me that that 
hit me kind of between the eyes, and, and I think it hits us as a culture as well. As well, Sometimes we think maybe when we don't say anything, we are taking a neutral position. A neutral position. There is no neutral position with God. None. There's no neutral position with God. There's no, I'm going to wait and see. If we wait too long, the Bible gives us a pretty good picture in the New Testament of what's going to happen. It's a story of a bridegroom and some brides, the brides that are waiting on the bridegroom to show up. There's 12 of them. Half of them are keeping enough oil in their lamp at night to wait on the bridegroom to get there. Uh, the others only prepare half the oil because they figure, you know, if he doesn't show up by then, they'll be done. So during the time those other the other half of the brides that are waiting to be met by the bridegroom are waiting to meet him, their flame goes out, they have to go get more oil, and they miss the opportunity for the bridegroom to come. This parable is a parable about Jesus coming and certain people not being ready and, and prepared for when he shows up. And there is no neutral ground with God is what I say because if we are not prepared when he comes, we miss the opportunity. We miss the chance. And it is absolutely possible for us to miss the chance the chance for the blessing, the chance to change your life. If that time comes and you're not there, I can't make any promises to what's going to happen. So I say this to say that these characters in the Old Testament, these people of God are standing and they feel like they're in a neutral zone, but either you miss the chance or you get the chance. And if they're not careful, they're going to miss the opportunity. And, and even worse, they're going to be counted as enemies of God. And so God is gracious. He's giving them a chance to turn around and to make a stand for him. Yet, none do so. Elijah then tells the people, I am the only remaining prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Then he tells them what to do. They proceed with the bulls and the fire and the water and everything else. So the Lord's fire fell and consumed the burnt offering, the wood, the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw this, they fell face down and said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Now God was gracious enough to give them the time to see this victory, and, and Elijah got to see this victory of God. But you got to imagine that he was discouraged that it took this for them to believe. Man, maybe if somebody had stood with him ahead of time, what's going to happen next might not have happened. So Elijah sends the people down. They slaughter the rest of the prophets of Baal. He sends Ahab back home and tells Ahab, you need to go to Jezreel, which is where he's from, and where Jezebel is waiting on him, and tell them what I've said. That it's going to rain, number one, and that the Lord is God, number two. And so he sends Ahab on his way, and he says that Ahab went to eat. So Ahab went to eat and drink, but Elijah went up to the summit of Carmel. So he sent Ahab on, and Elijah goes back to Mount Carmel, and he gets up, and he bends down over his knees and praying or whatever else he may be doing. He asks the servant to go and check over the, sea, the Mediterranean Sea to see if a cloud is coming. God comes back six times. There's no cloud, no chance of rain. He sends him one more time. And the last time he comes back and he says, uh, very funny, he says, there's a cloud as small as a man's hand coming up from the sea. And Elijah, in his faith, this is great faith. It's an awesome victory. He says, go and tell Ahab, get your chariot ready and go down so the rain doesn't stop you to go back home. In a little while, the sky grew dark with clouds and wind and there was a downpour. So Ahab got in his chariot and went to Jezreel. The power of the Lord was on Elijah, and he tucked his mantle under his belt and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. It's an awesome scene, an awesome victory of faith in what God was doing in, in Elijah's midst. He's on a mountaintop experience, quite literally. But look what happens next. I'm going to tell you the next part of the story. Elijah journeys there, and as he gets there, Jezebel says to Ahab these words. It's here, uh, verse 2 in chapter 19, uh, 1 Kings 19. May the gods punish me and do so severely if I don't make your life, the life of Elijah, like the life of one of whom, uh, of them by this time tomorrow. I'm talking about those who have just died at their hand, at his hand. He said, if you're here tomorrow, so help me, I will slaughter you. Now, Elijah's just seen God burn up and kill 450 prophets of Baal. He's just seen God win a major victory on the mountaintop. Is that good enough? 
Sadly, no, it's not. Instead, what Elijah does is he allows his fear to overtake him. Then Elijah became afraid, and immediately he ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba, that belonged to Judah, he left his servant there, but he went on his on a day's journey into the wilderness. He sat down under a broom tree and prayed that he might die. He said, I've had enough. Lord, take my life, for I'm no better than my father's. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. He sleeps. He wakes up. The angel says, take some food. You need your strength. He eats. He goes to sleep. He wakes up. The angel says, take some food. You need your strength. Now, why is he so afraid? Well, he's afraid because he's afraid he's going to be killed. It doesn't matter how high the mountaintop moment is, y'all. We, when we face the opinion of the popular crowd, many, many times will dwindle and shrink and be silent. And I think we do that, and I, I include me in that bunch, because we think, well, I'm not one of them. Well, I'm fine. I, I didn't do those things. Or, you know, my life's fine the way it is, and we can identify with that. But I also think when I, we can identify with the other half of this equation as well, with Elijah, to see, may we have a great victory in God in one moment, but we don't see friends who are backing us and are there to encourage us. It says that he left his servant in the wilderness. Nobody was with him. He was alone, and he was defeated. When we're left alone like that, y'all, we fall prey to fear and the fear of man so often. I do. I mean, my sin most often comes when I am alone, spiritually, physically. When my mind starts playing tricks on me, and I start to doubt God and His strength and His power, or maybe when when it's just me parenting the kids by myself, and and I lash out in anger at them because really no other adults are around to see. So what does it matter? Elijah does the same thing. But God doesn't leave him there. So he goes and he spends the night in a cave, and God speaks to him in the cave. Suddenly the word of the Lord came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? It's a startling question. I once heard Lig and Duncan preach a message on this about eight years ago at Together for the Gospel. It's one of the most powerful sermons I've ever heard preached. I want to encourage you to go and listen to it. It's on 1 Kings 19. I forget the name of the sermon now, but Ligon, L-I-G-O-N, Duncan, D-U-N-C-O-N, uh, or D-C-A-N. Ligon Duncan preached this message on the power of 1 Kings 19 and the challenge that it is to us because here's Elijah who has seen this great victory from God over all of these people and all these big, strong men, and yet he's afraid of this one woman, even though she is a queen. And God says, what are you doing huddled in a cave, Elijah? What are you doing here? And Elijah replies as if God doesn't know, I've been very zealous for you, the Lord God of armies. But the Israelites have abandoned your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I am left and they are looking for me. I I alone am left and they are looking for me to take my life. See, even though the people eventually acknowledged and honored God after that victory on Mount Carmel, they really didn't believe. I mean, they just did what they responded to in the moment. And Elijah knew this, knew that he was alone by earthly standards. But he was not alone. He had the God of the universe at his backing. He was following ahead. He was following behind God who ran ahead of him. And yet even he came off this mountaintop moment. And I see, I mentioned this because I think this really applies to connecting the sinews of things in our life is that we're now seeing three months of a, a pretty bad stretch. If you go all the way back to 20, the beginning of 2020, this year's been a really rough year. I mean, really bad. And you connect each of these things together, but for all the bad things, there's been so much good that God has done as well. I mean, it wasn't, but in the middle of February, so it's March, April, May, June, July, right? So we're, we're at four months, really three and a half months ago, we saw an incredible revival here. It feels like an eternity that Life Action Silver Team was here, and we saw people come to know Christ, and we saw revitalization amongst our people and a love that hasn't been here in ages, and yet, look at us now, huddled in our homes, afraid to reach out and touch one another. 
what are you doing, Elijah? It's almost like God is asking us, what are you doing, church? Why are you huddled? Why are you waiting? Why are we being quiet when it comes to issues of social love, socially loving one another, whether it be the police departments who need support and better training and love for their officers, or it be our black brothers and sisters in Christ who are underrepresented and, and unheard in many ways and instances, and to say, we love all all of you, and we want to build a reconciliation amongst our people, God's people. But yet we shrink away in fear because we feel like we're alone. And we're not the Black Lives, Ladder movement, Black Lives Matter movement, political movement, I mean, or we're not the Blue Lives Matter movement, political movement, or we're not one party or another. But if not now, then when would we disassociate ourselves from any political party and say, we are called to love no matter the consequences? So that God doesn't come to us and say, what are you doing, church? Why not just get up and love somebody? The angel of the Lord appeared to Elijah and he told Elijah, go out and stand on the mountain in the Lord's presence. At that moment, the Lord passed by. A great and mighty wind was tearing at the mountains and was shattering cliffs before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a voice, a soft whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He says, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of armies. He replied, But the Israelites have abandoned your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I am alone I alone am left am left. And they're looking for me to take my life. Then the Lord said to him, Go. Return by the way you came into the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you are anoint to anoint Hazael as king over Aram. You are to anoint Jehu, son of Nemishi, as king over Israel. Elisha, son of Saphat, as Abel Malona, uh, Mehola, as prophet in your place. Then Jehu will put to death whoever escapes the sword of Hazael. And Elisha will put to death whoever escapes the sword of Jehu. But I will leave 7,000 in Israel, every knee that has not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Notice what God says there. There are 7,000 people who haven't bent to knee to Baal. Elijah's wrong. Elijah's wrong. He's not alone. He is not alone, the only one that is left. And I'm telling you, you are not alone. You may fail and fall, and God may be saying, what are you doing here, church? But we are not alone. We have one another. We have our other brothers and sisters in Christ. We have a, a cooperating body of millions of people, a part of the Southern Baptist Convention, who want to work together to see God move and reach people with the gospel. We are not alone, church. We're not alone. My encouragement to you reading this is to say that we are to get up, dust off our cloak, tuck in our mantle. That's to tuck in to the, to the, um, the fold and to the front rope so that you can run and begin to go forward. We're not Elijah. We haven't seen God as Elijah saw God move. God isn't speaking to us in quite so literal a word to say, Where are you, what are you doing here, church? But I can promise you that God is expecting much from the church. And we are not alone, nor should we act like we're alone. We have one another. You have me, I have you. We're to bear one another up, to love one another, and to see what God can do to radically change our culture, if only we will go and do. So that's the challenge. There's a question I want you to ask. So what do I do now? So what do I do now? Pandemic is still here, not going away anytime soon, but we have a sense of normalcy in life. There's a massive need in the world for the love of Jesus right now with all of those. I mean, we saw a video today of a police officer literally 
in tears in a McDonald's drive through line because she was so anxious about not being able to eat her food safety, safely. We saw another police officer charged today in Atlanta with felony murder charges for the shooting of, an, of a black man running away from police officers with a taser gun after a fight had ensued. I use both those examples because that's two sides of the aisle to say that this is a very dark time. So what do you do now? We're going to talk about that. We're starting to talk about the book of James on Sunday. James is a very practical book of the Bible that gives us some how-tos for our culture and time to live and love as Christ does. I hope you'll tune in and join with us. I hope this time and connecting some of the pieces of Elijah's life have been helpful for you to see that even if you've been afraid and you've backed down, you're not lost. It's not too late. You're not forgotten. Let's not be those people who cannot and will not proceed in Christ because we forgot what the victory on Mount Carmel looks like. Let us not be those people who need to see God lick up a sacrifice with fire. Instead, let us be those when Elijah calls and says, who believes one way or the other, God or Baal, that we say, oh, we believe in God and show it with our lives. I love you all. I pray for you desperately. I cherish you deeply. I pray that you have a week that is enriched in God's word and encouragement with the family. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.